Hello everybody and welcome to our Leaders in Astrology series. Today we are honoured and privileged to introduce highly esteemed astrologer, publisher, archivist, musician and programmer Michael Erlewine. So thank you so much for joining us today and how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, far, far away, I'm here to uh, I'm at your service. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. So I'd love to start this interview at the beginning of your astrological journey. So could you share with us how you first became interested in astrology and what that environment was like? Well, it's kind of complicated, but I'm happy to do it. You know, I was uh, raised at, in a time where psychology was having, kind of, you know, which really came up in the 30s, but I was born in the early 40s. Mm. Um I think that I got into astrology because when I went to school and did that kind of stuff, they did, you know, we didn't have, they, they didn't treat your person. Mostly we were being analyzed about our psychology. Were, you know, were we paranoid? Were we schizophrenic? Mm -hmm. Were we manic depressive? And that really, it's not so cool to come up and that be, those are the most popular terms that you had. So when I came across astrology, which had more noble qualities for a person, you know, looking at a natal chart, mm -hmm. uh, I liked the idea of having some other picture of myself besides different kinds of uh, illnesses, mental illnesses, right? So that, that's actually what happened. But fascinating. So at that time, did you have any sources of inspiration? Were there any astrologers that you followed at the time or any books that were available to you that inspired your your delve or your tiptoeing into astrology well short answer is no that the, the there were books and also it's hard to say i'm hard to teach mm. i never got out of high school for instance mm. I, I, I was just not interested in learning and i'm very fussy about who teaches me and a person has to have uh, a lot of life knowledge in order for me to credit, make them credible enough so that I, I want to hear what they have to say. So I think I came up that way. And even in the world of astrologers, and because I was a programmer, I got to meet most of the, almost all of them. And some of them, you know, at close quarters and for long periods of time. Um, but and I was I was at UAC a couple of years some some years ago, and there was a young guy that was interviewing people, and he asked me who influenced me, and he got really he got actually angry at me, and I have it on tape, it's on YouTube even, uh, because I I said I didn't really learn much from anyone, except Theodore Landscheid, and I I knew them all. I met Rudyard. I talked to Rudyard. I met all these people and I learned a lot from them, sort of. Mostly I just got friendship from her or, or just they were another astrologer. And, and, I, and I knew all of them somewhat. But did, did I? most of my astrology came out of my own head, mm. um, with the exception Grant Louis' book, Astrology for the Millions, was important to me. Um, but really it was Theodore Landscheid who was a, a climatologist and astrologer and a Supreme Court Justice of Germany. Wow. And I sent him his first computer in 1978 because he didn't have any way of getting one. And he did a lot of research on that computer. And he came to my home and uh, he taught me a lot about the, he, he wrote a book early on called Cosmic Cybernetics. And Cosmic Cybernetics is about uh, the fact that any any kind of system, any large scale system, like or even a body, has to have a certain amount of information flow, in order for it to be uh, coherent, to remain coherent. And cybernetics is a study of that kind of thing of what it takes to run a 
run a, a system. And so he pointed out that even systems like the galaxy or the solar system have to have some some flow of information. And some of those ideas uh, were very important to me. And that, and I had, you know, I had one of the largest libraries in the world, which I donated to the University of Illinois. So it's not like I didn't have a lot of books. Eventually, I had tens of thousands of them. Uh, but that book and some other stuff that he wrote actually affected me. I actually learned from him. I consider him a teacher of mine. But if you ask me, I was a really close friend to, to Charles Jane, who knew a lot of stuff, but did I learn a lot from him? A good friendship. We would fly back and forth to each other's houses, celebrate birthdays. Did I learn astrology from him? I learned what he did, and he learned what I did. But did I learn, did I go and do that? No. So probably more than you want to know. So would it be fair to say that you had that that inner drive, maybe that cardinal energy to go out and answer your own questions as opposed to going and learning from other people? Is that self-motivation to answer your own questions that you had? I think the most important thing to get in astrology or anywhere else is some experience. And experiences can be contrasted with uh, what we'd call just intellect and conceptuality, talking about it. Uh, language and language is a, a basically just like I'm a programmer, so it's a it's a system of pointers. It 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 doesn't mean anything in itself. It's a vehicle to, to point beyond itself. Basically, language is, depends on the sense that it makes. And if it doesn't make sense, we call it nonsense. <laughs> and and so, uh, so all language points beyond itself to, to the sense world, to actually physically feeling and living. You know, mm -hmm. like Shakespeare said, "To be or not to be." Uh, I was always interested in the experience. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to experience life, and that's why I left high school. I just wanted to go out. I hitchhiked to California and lived in Venice West on the beach and mm -hmm. in an old frozen food locker in a, in a big thing called the Gas House, which was like a big art gallery. And this was 1960. So stuff like that. I was always um, wanting to experience, wanting to uh, to feel, feel it. I didn't want to just talk about it. Mm. So, and I believe I, also you were hitchhiking with Bob Dylan and, and meeting some uh, some great minds at that time as well. 1961, I hitchhiked with Bob Dylan. I spent time with him and I helped him put on a conference, I mean, a, a concert in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and just hung out with him. We just we were hitching on the road together. Uh, but he was also not the Bob Dylan that was famous. He was the mm -hmm. Bob Dylan that was almost famous. But he, to me, he was just like another guy that was you know, really bright and really interested in music. And so that's what brought us together, right? That's quite remarkable, that search for experience. And I believe you're only born a couple of weeks apart. So that's quite, really quite fascinating. Okay. So I've heard you talk about astrology being a form of cultural astronomy. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. That uh, astrology is, um, well, totally dependent upon the astronomy. I mean, it's, that's the, I mean, that's that's that, that's how you define it. That it's trying to interpret what 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 astronomical factors, astronomical events. What are they? What do they mean? So it's our job to uh, to try to do our best. And astrologers agree to differ, and they really much differ. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm I'm not. I don't think that. I mean, I wouldn't have much, so much good to say about all that. It's just, it's just that I don't. Astrologers confuse astrology with psychic phenomenon and it's being psychics and mediums and all that's crazy. Astrology, by definition, is about cultural astronomy. What mm -hmm. what does what does astronomy mean in life and in in history? I mean, you tell me what what other kind of astrology is there? I don't know of any other kind. Do you? Absolutely. And it's a great point. So 
for you, what's the importance, especially nowadays, of younger astrologers understanding the astronomy behind the astrology? Because it seems to be uh, now with all the p computer programming and things on phones, we're kind of, do you think we're kind of losing that connection to the underpinnings of the astrology? Say that, rephrase that. So how, how important is it for younger astrologers these days to understand the astronomy behind the astrology? Well, apparently not very because they don't even have computer programs anymore, most of them. They're, they're just taking stuff off the internet. It's getting farther and farther away. I think, it, I think it's important to understand some astronomy hmm. just because astrology is all about astronomy, right? I mean... What else is it? I mean, oh, I don't oh. know of anything else. So that I'm interested in, and and certainly we, there's no argument about astronomy, about you know when two planets coincide and have a conjunction or something. That's all just astronomy, right? Right. Yeah. You know, the only argument is that what I think it means, mm. a given event, and what you think it means, or any other astrologer, differ. We don't agree. <laughs> and some of us are pretty pretty far from the mark. Uh, it's not it's not even coherent, right? It's it's crazy. So it uh, goes back to your point of cultural astronomy, where you know the astronomy right. is a fact. So if you have a moon Saturn conjunction, that is a fact. What you're saying is where people will differ is on the meaning and the interpretation of that. Right, and and I have that at birth. I have a Saturn Moon Uranus conjunction that in azimuth, it's less than. Half a degree, all of them, three together. But on the, on the ecliptic, it's like three degrees apart. Wonderful. I was watching the podcast with you with the brilliant Chris Brennan and your interview talking about, I think you were talking about the Uranus-Neptune trine that you have. Yeah. Uh, actually share with, with Bob Dylan. I thought what was quite interesting as well is the, I don't know how far apart in terms of orb, but you have, I think, a Uranus-Saturn conjunction as well with, with Bob Dylan. So what came to mind for me was just the shakeup of the status quo. I know Bob Dylan wrote many songs that were anti-establishment and uh, protest songs and, and for civil rights. And I just thought it was quite an interesting part but, but, of that. But, but the Uranus-Neptune uh, trine was a powerful event. Bob Dylan was born in May. I was mm. born in July. Um, you know, yeah, set, well, now, Saturn and Uranus were were together, and and Neptune was in in Virgo, as we know. So it's not hard to turn that into music. Neptune mm. has everything to do with music, and so I think that that that's what uh, Dylan and I share is that, uh, and then I, you know, I have an it, it, you know we could look at it if you want. I could show you. I could show you. Maybe I should. Maybe I should share the screen and show you a couple of things. Okay, sure. Let me give you that the um, co-host abilities, and, and then I'll, you should I'll be able try to, to figure this out. Okay. And I'm just going to you know, go ahead and do that here. <clears throat> Can you see it? Wonderful. Can you make that uh, full screen by hitting the, the square? I can try. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yep. This, this, but see, I don't like the smallness of the uh, planet. So you can't see it well enough? Is that the idea? Uh, I can see it now perfectly. Is this okay for you? Not so good. I, I... That's fine. If you want to change it, that that's fine as well. That's whatever you're comfortable with. Let me just try to compromise here. Okay. How's that? Can you see that well enough? That that's great, and I can zoom in on the edited video as well, so that's great. Okay, so that that's my heliocentric chart. Hmm. And you can see exactly what I was talking about. Uh, there's Saturn, Uranus, uh, and if we went to you know the Moon would be in the geo chart, but I have a grand trine. Mm. That that takes uh, six planets to make it up, and it's very exact. You know, there's twenty five degrees, twenty five degrees, twenty six degrees, right? That's that's pretty good. Uh, mm. 
And because it's a trine, the space on all different sides is balanced. That an important thing to look at, first of all, I only look at a 360 degree wheel. I mean, I can look at stuff like that. There I am, I have Neptune, or this is just, but I have to put it into geo mm -hmm. uh, and then do it. Yeah, I have the node, Northern node and Neptune can jump the midheaven it's pretty darn exactly, right? Yep. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> what I think an important thing to look at, it, if we could take all of these planets in the heliocentric is very different than the geocentric mm. in, in my work. And a lot of people think of me as a heliocentric astrologer when that's just kind of crap. I use many different coordinate systems. That doesn't make me only a heliocentric astrologer. It just means mm. that I'm able to use the geocentric, the heliocentric, azimuth and altitude, which I d developed a whole technique called local space. That's about uh, mostly used for relocation, but uh, I probably have, there's a local space chart there, mm. but um, my point is, is that if, if, I, if I took these nine planets and distributed them equally, mm. they'd have about 40 degrees that separated each one. Right, that you understand it. Yep. So the point of that is that if you find someone in the helio that has equally distant planets, even close, they're much more stable. Mm. The heliocentric system is, of course, a system based on gravity. The gravity of the planets in relating relating mm. to the sun, but the geocentric chart is not based on gravity. It's just based on taking a snapshot from Earth of the solar system. Just so, and so that the, I learned pretty early on from programming that the heliocentric chart is the mother, if you want to do it that way, hmm. and that the geo is the child. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's the most important chart that we have, and I call it the, the karma chart. Hmm. And I call it our standard geocentric chart. I, I'm sorry, I, I had it backwards. I call it the Dharma chart, mm. and the, the the geocentric, which is out here's my geocentric, which oops, I'll switch back mm. to this, um, which is very different, is called called the Karma chart, because the geocentric chart is a chart of the circumstances and the conditions into which we were born, and in which we live. But the one who lives there, or the tribe that that one belongs to, I call the Dharma chart. Mm. The heliocentric chart shows you the Dharma. What what are the, what's the vocation? What's the path? Mm. What what are the powers that they have? What tribe do they belong to? So this may be more than you want to hear, but I'm just. Oh no, this is absolutely fascinating, and I hope you don't mind me making an observation because I've heard no, you. go talk about this before so geocentrically you have your your mars domicile in aries but in the heliocentric you have that mars in aquarius mm. and i couldn't help but think of the the, the remarkable generosity you have given to the community in terms of if you go to spiritgrooves.net with the amount of free books that you right. give away and, and to libraries i was wondering if there was a lot of effort put into to give in knowledge and putting a lot of effort into giving things away to the community, like a collective feel. That was just a, a slight observation. Now, I hear, yeah, and when, when I first, first of all, I first did a heliocentric chart just because I was a programmer, because I right. had to do all these things. Mm. And so I didn't know it from Adam, right? Mm. And then and the first thing I did is exactly what you said. I looked at my uh, geocentric chart and says, boy, I have Mars in Aries, which is kind of an active, Pretty active Mars, but actually, in truth, in, in relation to the center of the sun and gravitationally, it was actually in Aquarius. And so I did exactly what you did. I said, well, I might be kind of pretty highly active guy, which I'm a, I am, mm. but maybe my activity or even my temper, which I have a bit of a temper, <laughs> uh, it does Aquarian stuff that what I do ends up producing Aquarian effects. Mm. Now, now this one I was saying, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to say I was the same way you are, which is that's the kind of astrology I did 
when I first got into the helio, exactly uh, what I did. Okay. But over time, I found out I stopped doing any of that kind of stuff because there's something to the helio that's much greater, much, much more powerful than anything that's ever been. Just remember that you've heard, probably heard me talking to Chris or anyone. Hmm. 500 years ago, Copernicus pointed out to us that everything does not revolve around us. Everything does not revolve around the Earth. The Earth revolves around the sun. Mm. What does that tell us? Well, astronomers, which were then astrologers too, mm. they said, ah, oh, I get it. And they walked away with two charts, a helio and a geo. But astrologers never took that empowerment. They never took the two charts. They stuck with the one chart, and they still do today. And you could just say this as a... You know, the two oldest disciplines academically are botany mm. and astronomy. And astrologers and astronomers make a pretty good living. Astrologers are struggling. Right. They don't they don't make a good living. Don't tell me they do because maybe a few do, but mostly not. And I've you know, we had forty or fifty thousand customers in my when when I was running my company. So I got to meet a lot of them. Gee, they're just uh they're just not able to make a living. Now, what is that? What where did they go wrong? What what is wrong? And I'm saying what's wrong is that they failed to be empowered by that simple thing that everything doesn't revolve around us. I think that's a very fascinating point. And when you go back to Copernicus's heliocentric model, it really shook up the establishment of the of the time that maybe our human nature, where we think everything arolls around us, is that selfish part of us that we think we're, we are incredibly special. And as you're saying, we're just part of, of the wider solar system, the wider universe, and we're not the center of everything. And, and to see it from that perspective, I think that's a, a wonderful point. Yeah, so anyway, so what I, what I did discover is that when I begin to look at a heliocentric chart, what I had never seen mm -hmm. before, of course we have Mark Edmund Jones had different kind of chart patterns but not at the degree that I got into it and in the sense that I begin to realize that when aspects connect using basically Ptolemaic aspects all around the chart, when they connect like this grand trine, they create patterns. And I came up with 60 patterns in, in the early 70s. Hmm. These patterns actually represented archetypes. They weren't just, well, he's got a grand trine, whatever we think that is. No, this grand trine is is like an entity. It's, it's like an archetype. I call them, I originally call them star types or just chart patterns. And very soon I stopped looking at Mars in Aries and Mars in Aquarius, which is what I would do geocentrically. Mm. And I began to, to study and did hundreds of thousands of charts eventually when computers came along and look at the nature of these tribes so that we would have a tribe that was made of like my my own. It's all all easy aspects, what what I call green lines. They're, they're all the easy aspects are colored green, but mm. there's no cross in the center. Right? There's no there are individual squares, but there's no T cross or grand cross and stuff like that. So the point is is that over time, I begin to realize that heliocentrically, in fact, I studied, I, I did a lot of astro studying astronomy, not just programming it, which is hard enough, but I spent many, many years in a physics library in Arbor, Michigan, mm. uh, studying deep space. I published a book in 1976 called Astrophysical Directions, basically showing astrologers, uh, you know, how we could look at it, doing it all in our coordinate systems instead of, you know, right ascension and declination. So but what I'm trying to get at is simply saying that there are there are groups of types of aspects. And I, uh, you know, I had 60 of them or so. I could show you some if you want. But that these things were more important than just being able to say, well, Mars and Aries, Mars and Aquarius, right? That's mm -hmm. the kind of stuff that I used to do. And I learned all the stuff, the same as you did, about 
uh, and I had tried to squeeze the Dharma out of my heli my geocentric chart because that's the only chart I have. There's a great uh, great jazz tune which I like to talk about with Eddie Harris and Les McCann called "Compared to What." <laughs> Compared to what? We don't have anything to compare it to, so that we only we're stuck with squeezing the juice out of the geocentric chart when really. A panoply or a group of charts, each with a different viewpoint, gives us a lot more information so that heliocentric and geocentrically ch charts can triangulate. Mm. You, you get a stereo view of what's going on. Obviously, a view from Earth to the sun is, is good for that. But it's not everything because you, you, you cannot see what was happening in the sun unless you look at the heliocentric chart. And the two, you need the two. I always use both of the charts to kind of triangulate and get a picture of how how a person appears. That would be their geocentric chart. And then who is the person that's appearing? So I'm just not trying to lecture you here. I'm just no, trying I, this to- This is why I love these conversations because in a way you're teaching me now, and this is something that's opened my mind now in this conversation for maybe myself to even look more from a heliocentric point of view and to, like you say, to triangulate or pull all those charts together, zoom out and and to look at it in, in what, different ways. You want to look at your uh, want to look at your chart right now? Uh, sure. Let's go. <laughs> OK. Uh, you know, you're going to have to tell me what's your name? It's uh, Callum, C-A-L-L-U-M. OK. OK. I think that's good enough. And what when were you born? February 6, 1987. Just a youngster. <laughs> and then what time? 10.31 p.m. And where? It's a place called Billinge in the United Kingdom. That's B-I-L-L-I-N-G-E. G-E? Mm -hmm. B-I-L-L-I-N-G-E. -E. Uh, Okay. Small little town. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm going to look at both of the charts quickly. Okay. Aha. Okay, this this is interesting. It verges on, but isn't. Um, it's not. A, it it has a T square that's trying to form or that had formed but mostly it's an odd it's an odd archetype it belongs to i forget the number of it but what mm. what what i've learned by doing thousands and thousands of charts of people is that this kind of configuration brings uh i don't know how to put it an unusual view instead mm. of having the normal it's it's very how to put that it's very analytical it like it likes to grasp things but it's always going to be coming from another point of view it's not going to be the normal point of view it's going to be a correct point of view but it's going to be coming out of left field or it's going to be just an alternate view is one of the ways that i call this oh wow but it but it also has this this t square this that's trying to be uh but it's also it's up it's it's yeah, I guess it will complete itself. I guess Mercury will catch up and you'll get a T-square. When you get these T-squares, it means the ability to to, to to take action and actually accomplish something. Mm. And all the green lines, all the trines and sextiles, they're you, how you can use the mind. So that what, what, would you, what we'd want to do is say, you use the mind to get things done. Uh, and because that it has both green and red lines in it, it makes you, in my experience, this is all that you're getting, more more independent than most. That means that some of your type of chart don't even marry because they are self-involved. They, they have everything they need just in themselves. Mm. That They don't necessarily, but they can find a partner, but then it has to match up the partner is going to be competing with the fact that you can pretty much self-sustain mm. more than an average person. Uh, and if we look at your 
geocentric chart, um, yeah, there's no T cross there. It's all mental, right? Mm, absolutely. So you appear you appear to be more intellectual than you actually are. You're actually much more of a a feeling person than you appear to be. You have, I mean, I don't mean to be insulting or anything. I'm just. Oh no, you've uh, you've hit the. You, this is mind blowing. You've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> well, then, in that case, you you want to study your. What happened to me is is that I got into my. Uh, heliocentric chart and before i i knew it before i really understood it mm. i was tra i was literally transmigrating my identity i began to identify with the heliocentric chart and transfer my identity from the geo to the helio which never went back it never reversed itself wow that uh, but to me that, that that's what i call empowerment i was empowered by that experience and then i tried to tell astrologers about it like i am you right now mm. for for decades but you know that they, they just didn't get it or they didn't want to get it they're ignorant they like their ignorance in the sense that they say well we don't live on the sun mm. and of course we don't but we certainly live off the sun and because of the sun and the sun is and of course, if you read, read Landscheid and stuff, the sun is just a step-down transformer of energy. It's not like we looking at the universe. It's the looking the universe is looking at us out through mm. our eyes in the sense that, I mean, I have to laugh. We're constantly looking for intelligent life. <laughs> we, we, we're, we are the intelligent life. We are the, that's the whole universe is looking through our eyes mm. at itself, right? I mean, that's what's going on. But astrologers, you know, I know I sound pejorative because I kind of am in the sense that astrologers need to to wake up. They need to take that empowerment that they didn't take back in you know, 500 years ago and uh, you know go to school, learn to use their mind mm. instead of... We don't have a lot of great thinkers, especially... I don't know too many right now. Maybe you can tell me some and I can call them up and talk to them. But uh, I mean, people like John Addy, uh, Landscheid, Charles Harvey, a whole series of, of very bright guys. And I'm sure they must exist or gals, uh, but I'm damned if I can find them. Yeah. <laughs> because I'd like to talk to them because I have something to talk to, but no one to talk to about it with. No who come, no who come to that level that's absolutely remarkable and especially here you've described myself to a t and it my feeling part where i just have this insatiable curiosity that's why i like speaking to great minds like yourself just to to try and through osmosis just try and get ideas and, and pull things together less in an intellectual sense and more in like you said as, of, of a feeling sense so you have literally michael just blow my mind with what you just pulled <laughs> well, up there <laughs> well, all that means is that you should consider transmigrating mm. and learning to identify because it's your chart. It, it's it's not like something that you don't own. You are that. You well, are you, that. Thank you so much because you've just opened a new window now that I have to now jump down the rabbit hole with. So why why do you think, in a sense, that the the heliocentric way of viewing charts has fallen maybe to the wayside or is not as as popular as the, the geocentric. It, it it hasn't fallen to the wayside. It never got off the wayside. Ah. Mm. Right? Who I mean the astronomers have it, they're doing well. But you know, they stopped interpreting it, right? They're they're no longer interpreting what it means. So that's up to us, but we can do a better job than that, but we haven't. That's really quite remarkable. And, and and thinking about one of your books as well, I mean, so many fantastic publications, but one book in particular, Solar Flares, and you're talking about the, the life force and the energy of the sun. Uh, can you maybe explain a bit more about the, the concept of that book? And since we're talking about heliocentric... Well, I've written quite more than one book about that, and I've written, a, I don't know, score of articles or something about it. It's simply that the energy from the sun reaches us every you know, nine minutes or whatever it is. But the sun is a variable star. It's not constant. It has a different kinds of cycles, it has a you know 11 year cycle, a 22 year cycle. 
But right now we mostly look at the sunspot cycle, which is a cycle of about 11 years or something like that. And we're on the rise of it right now. So that the variability of the energy coming from the sun isn't always what we call sunlight, which you know grows our plants and warms our bodies and all that kind of stuff. It's it it gets really really intense periodically, and it's it's doing it right now. I don't know what it is today. I could check, um, but I check about it all the time. The point is that when the sun kind of blows its top, it has what's called CMEs, coronal mass ejection, and it ejects huge quantities of itself into space and if the sun is facing if the earth is facing if it, if the, the spot from which it is is facing earth we are subject to it it can blow mm. out transistors and electrical mm. grids and stuff like that but that's not my interest my interest is what does it you know i'm an astrologer mm. how do i interpret that what does it do for us internally as beings and what it does is um I'll try to put it as clearly as I can. Sunlight initiates change. The whole idea of solar energy is, is that it provides the, a, a modicum of change. And change is like money. It, it, we can do anything we want with it. That is, it it's not like you, it's just going to hurt us or not hurt us. If we can seize the, seize the energy that comes from the sun during a solar flare, for example, hmm. we can get a lot done or we can, uh, Landshide had another book that he didn't translate. To, it was never translated to English till I had Robert Schmidt. You know who Robert Schmidt is? Part of the, the project Hindsight and- Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, he, yeah. but before he was in astrology, he came and lived at our center for a couple of years. That's oh, that's right. It. Is it the Heart, uh, the Heart Center publications? Is that- Yeah, correct? yeah, well, actually, yeah, he did. He even published one of my books called hmm. Astrology of the Heart because he thought it was it wasn't Greek, but he thought it was an important book. And Stephen Forrest wrote the introduction to it. Wow. So now I got off track. Where am I? Uh, so yeah, I you're did? talking about solar flares and oh yeah, yeah. no 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 I know that. So that so what happens when when a solar flare comes, even from the moment it happens the basic light and stuff reaches us right away, but it takes about a day or two for the CME along with the solar wind to reach earth. And the thing to think about, the way to look at this is that suddenly we have a huge amount of change thrust into us. So what do we do? Well, what most people do is go lie down because they're, they find it overwhelming. And we've done it for millennia so that we don't even think about it. We just like, you know what a sea anemone is? No. Okay, well, it's a thing with those little fingers that go out, but when it's frightened or anything happens, it all closes up like that. Ah, okay. So that when a solar package of energy comes that we can't handle, we just close. And we. it's not like we just are aware of it. We've done this forever, for eternity. And then after... It's safe. We kind of open back up again. Is it so, in a sense maybe too much energy or too much of a yeah? It's too much. much we can't ha we can't handle it. If hmm. you can surf it, I mean, if you can grasp the energy or seize the moment, you can do great things with it. Ah. So that Landshat wrote a book called Ch Children of the Light, and I had Bob Schmidt who spoke, who who could speak German, hmm. because he was at my center and and we were just close friends and I didn't know what to do with him actually. Uh, he was a physicist and a mathematician and stuff, but he wasn't quite an astrologer till he left here. I had him trans translate that book, which I have. I could send you a copy because mm. I can't really publish it. I don't have any rights to do that, but I think it's an important book because what it does is show by annotation, detailed, detailed annotation, all the great events and things that scientists and stuff did on Earth that coincided with these bursts of solar energy. And he and he's trying to say yes that this solar energy causes us to have breakthroughs to wake up, and it, it's a book about that. So that's what I'm trying to say is that, hmm. and right now these last months we have having some tremendous solar flares, and that it probably has to do with the war in Ukraine and all this kind of stuff. Hmm. I'm not really that kind of mundane astrologer, but uh, 
So I don't know. What I am is a psychological kind of right. But even in, in those mundane terms, I wonder if there's some sort of correlation. Well, yeah, that someone yeah. would have to figure that out. I, I mean, certainly, the, these are rough times we're in, and politically, it's a nut house. Oh, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, that's just a brief idea. The idea that here is astrologers doing all this astrology, hmm. but they're they're ignoring the most important thing that's right in their face, giving them a suntan. Right? Hmm. They're not really monitoring their own sun, who's 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 going through a, a time of in, really great upheaval for the next couple of years or at least maybe a year and a half so so i've worried about that so that i've tried to help people help people understand what you do with the solar energy and how to use it and how how not just to be buffeted by it or so that you have to go lie down or you just are overwhelmed and it's just you know everything's confusing for a day or two so mm. uh, i don't think that anyone's doing that or a couple of people that's not not hard. Really anymore. fascinating point, and this is why I love these conversations because I get to learn from from great minds as yourself, and uh, I have so much to learn. So I look for forward to delving more into these into these topics. I'd like to switch on to which yeah. you have pioneered, which is local space astrology. So could you give us some history behind that? What made you decide to to coin that phrase or to co coin that subject, and what? What was behind the local space astrology? Well, it's a complicated answer. I could, I could just, I have to maybe do a sidebar first. Sure. Yeah. The yeah. Sidebar is that uh, I've run a Buddhist meditation center since the 1980s, and before that, I've been very, very involved in Tibetan Buddhism, and and, and uh, you know, I've been to Tibet a number of times and. Learned to read Tibetan, but not very well. And, and in Tibet, they have what are called tertons. And they are people who can, and they have what's called terma. So terma is what tertons find. And it's a long story, which I'll try to spare you. But, but I'm trying to think of how best to present it, that yeah, okay. Well, anyway, just to cut to the quick, I learned from my Tibetan practices and mm. with the help of a great number of very, very great, before, back in the 80s, the great Rinpoches that had left and fled Tibet came to the United States but had nowhere to go. Mm. They didn't have monasteries. They had nothing. And so they came to places like our center, which was called Karma Takes Them Cheerling, the Heart Center. It's called the Heart Center. Uh, and they would come and spend sometimes a week or a couple of days teaching because they had nowhere to go. So that those of us who were hosting them had a tremendous opportunity to spend time with ones that now you couldn't even get an appointment with if you were in India or wherever they are. So. Wow. So, okay, so the, the point of it is, is that from them, I learned how to go into my own mind. They have what are called mind treasures. That, And this is why I kind of joke at some of the people that are doing the, looking into the Greek and the Latin and all that stuff. So that's wonderful, but the great repository, the great libraries of your own mind. Mm. If you can learn to go in there, there's every thought that ever came out of every book, every poem, all came out of the mind. They came out of the present moment. Mm. For all of us, everything that ever existed came out of the mind itself, right? New ideas, inventions. And if you could learn to go in, into the mind, who knows what you would find? But So I learned to go into my mind, and I brought out a number of significant astrological techniques that no one is ever put together quite the way I did. Mm. And and one of them was local space. Mm. And all that local space is, is, is how to use and interpret azimuth and altitude. And and what it is, is that if you if you were born and your da dad picked you up or your mom picked you up, probably not your mom, she's probably resting, but your dad picked you up and walked outside 
and you saw Venus in the sky to the east, or the moon or Mars or whatever you could see to the some other place, those directions not only cut through these these are great circles. Mm. They they cut through space, but they also cut through the cities of the world, their directions on Earth. Mm. And so all I did was uh make a story, write a story uh, of how to use this uh, for for relocation. And then people liked it. Now it's in almost every program, but mm. I don't think they give me any credit anymore, but they should. They should, uh, because like you, you, you pioneered this, and it's uh, even at Kepler, we have a local space astrology course, and, and yeah. so fascinated bringing it to the locality, whether it's the lines cutting through, Moonlight, Jupiter, whatever that might be, is is absolutely fascinating. I'm not well versed in the subject, but you have spawned a great deal of interest in this area of yeah. astrology, which is remarkable. Well, but, but but I did. I also found out that from where I was born, which was Lancaster, Pennsylvania, mm. the line of Jupiter went right through Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ah, or, or very close. And then, but when I moved north to where I live now, mm. it brought my Saturn, Uranus moon conjunction instead of three degrees apart on the ecliptic it brought them into direct alignment with each other less than a half a degree wow so i'm just sort of saying so i test things out and if it works for me then i talk about it to people like yourself mm. if it doesn't i don't like i never could get into progressions i never i could never get anything at all but transits it's golden. I'm good with that. So anyway, so lo Local Space, I think I developed in the early 1970s, and I think it was first published by Charles Jane in Cosmicology Bulletin, the first article about Local Space. And other people have taken and written books about it and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that's just one. I, I did another thing called Interface. There's simply, and this is something Landscheid and I would talk about because he did, it has to do with with planetary nodes. Mm. He was interested in the planetary nodes as they intercepted and, and affected Earth. But what I was interested in was planetary nodes of the whole sol solar system as they affected each other. Because each one of them intercepting created different inclinations. Mm. So you either were inclined, those two planets, or if the planet was at the square point of that, you were disinclined. So I wrote another story about being inclined, you are inclined, so inclined. You say they say someone's so inclined, mm. or they're not so inclined to do something. So I I created that, and it was it's another whole technique that very few people have understood or care to use. And I did the same thing with the retrogrades. Mm. I, I showed how great retrogrades a thing a thing I call um, burn rate That's because right. it shows exactly what happens in retrogradation and interprets it so that you're either in you're either talking about something that's in your future that's coming or you're so, talking about something that's already passed and that you're drawing conclusions from but anyway i could go on and on and on well this this is really quite remarkable because it goes back to the point you were saying before when i was asking about influencers so yeah people that you may be friends with but it sounded like as you're saying today that you went into your own mind and I don't know if yeah, that exactly. was a form of meditation or to find or to answer your own questions or concepts that you wanted to develop yourself and pioneer those techniques rather than go into outside sources. Would that be a exactly. correct summary? So I, it, even though I had a library with tens of thousands of books and magazines, mm. and I looked through as many as I could stand to look through a lot of them are just awful. Uh, I found it much simpler because I'm basically lazy. Uh, much more interesting for me to go into the mind itself, and I learned how to do that, uh, and bring out something that might be interesting to some, it might not be. Uh, not everyone likes Helio, not everyone likes local space, but most everyone likes local space, actually. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, that's the kind of stuff I did, and then many other things. I have another thing that hasn't even registered yet called phase charts, the way to, the way to take your your basic natal chart and to look at the phases the angular separations like i can just say in in a minute or less mm. people know 
if we, if you and I were going to throw a party and invite people, and we want to know what lunar phase would it be, uh, and and if I said, well, just a lunar square would be good, you wouldn't buy that. You'd say no. The the waxing lunar square is very different for having a party than a waning right. one. Because, mm -hmm. but they, we we don't do that for all their other planets. The point is, is that all of those angular separations for all the combinations are either waxing or waning. Right. So I just developed, it's part, it's part of my, uh, the last program I wrote is called Blue Star. Mm. And it does a lot of this, these special techniques that I do. But if you take those same angular separations and put them together so that all of your waxing ones are on one side and all your, which is not true of the chart. The chart, you have to look and figure out, is this waxing or is this waning? Mm. Then you get a, what's called a phase chart, really easy to read. But, so that's just another thing that I did that hasn't really, no one's really looked at yet, but they will, but I'll probably be long gone. Uh, so I'd like to talk to people now about what I've done, but there's no one, no one really that, that knows enough or, or cares to know enough to talk about it, right? Well, this is why I love these conversations. So humbling for me because it shows how little I know. So, what so what new concepts are you thinking about right now? Of course, I can't converse with you in in, in the subjects, but what what do you have in mind at the moment? Well, my Dharma teacher, who spoke only Tibetan, I was with for thirty six years. I was a student. And I went to Tibet with him, and I also did a lot of things with his monastery. I was in charge of a lot of. We, I attended teachings on what's called Mahamudra, which is a kind of non-dualistic, it's not really meditation, it's non-meditation. Hmm. But I, I put out, helped him put on and was a video person for most of the time for 31 years, 10 day teachings, 10 days of Mahamudra training for 31 years, which means I drove to, this was in above Woodstock, New York in the mountains, I drove there enough time to go around the Earth equator twice. Oh wow! I went. I went to so many people. Um, okay, so now I get, you know, I get egotistical there, and then I forget what I'm doing. Um, so, so remind me again what. Oh no. Okay, so I'm, hmm. oh, okay. What I was going to try to tell you is that, uh, yeah. Now I remember. I, I got it back again. As, as you get older, also I had a major stroke. And oh. that makes it very hard for me to recall stuff. I have to actually sure. create stuff on the on the spot. But anyway, sure. in, in Tibetan Buddhism, I I went and studied. I studied. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Much harder. I think I, I think I'm a bit of a master of astrology, but I have not mastered the Dharma. Mm. But I'm very dedicated to it, and I went and got in line and did all of the hundreds of thousands of this and hundreds of thousands. Not only did I do it once, but my teacher told me to do it all over again. So, and the point is that, and and here's what he explained to me when when, when I said, well, you know, he, he told me that, Michael, I, I see that you've never done any harm with your astrology, but let me tell you how the Buddhists look at astrology. And I said, well, yeah, I, I want to hear that. And he says that, Astrology is one of the limbs of the yoga, but it's not the root. Astrology is is a dualistic condition. It, it has to do with what we call samsara, which we're all in. We're living in samsara, which is basically a cyclic. Everything that cycles is samsara. If it doesn't cycle, we don't know about it because it doesn't come back. Mm. Only the stuff that repeats itself is what makes up samsara. Anyway, uh, what he was trying to explain is that you're familiar with the old thing that rearranging the deck chairs of the Titanic? That's right, yeah, because it's sinking okay, well, anyway. There's no point rearranging. <laughs> no, but there is a point. What he was saying oh. to me, now I'm going to put it in my own language, okay. is that using astrology, we can rearrange, help someone get out of the situation they're in on on this earth mm. and move and improve that situation. But even 
which is a powerful tool. That's what that's the power of astrology. Mm. But even then, you're still rearranging the chairs. It's never going to take you out of samsara or show you how to get out of it. So astrology can't do that. What can do that is you're experiencing dharma enough that you can work your own way out of it. Ah. So, so, so I'm trying to get to the point of answering your question. So the question is, you're saying, what am I doing now? Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I'm still writing. I write a Facebook blog since 2007 every day, and a lot of it's about the Dharma, and and some of it's about astrology, and some is about music, and some is about whatever. Yeah. So, what I'm doing now is mostly Dharma stuff. Wonderful. I, I, I'm sharing. I'm trying to introduce some. I've got like I think 11,000 people. Wow. On my Facebook, either the friends and then followers, and then about a thousand people that I, I have no place to make them friends because I can't let them in, but they can still follow me, and then still follow. So, so and I'll anyways, take that link from you for this video, and I'll put it in the description below this video so people can follow you. Sure, yep. that's fine. So anyway, so what I'm doing now is actually uh, trying to prepare people to learn to do Mahamudra which is all that is, it's not all, it's very difficult. All that is, is basically learning to allow the mind to come to rest in the moment, in the present moment. The, the great Mahasiddha called Telopa, who was one of the progenitors of Mahamudra tradition, had these words of advice. These were his great words of advice, which are just incredibly valuable if you can take them to heart. And I'll just say them because they're just a couple of lines. One it says, he said, Telopa said, don't prolong the past. You know, don't try to bring it back. Mm. And he said, don't invite the future. He's talking about expectations, hopes, and dreams. Mm. Don't do that. He says, instead, and he says, and this is the hard one. He says, don't alter the present don't mess with it ah and then the last one is just relax just as it is so he said don't prolong the past don't invite the future and especially don't monkey with the present don't try to change it just relax as it is i know this may seem obvious or stupid but these are actually what are called upadesha these are pith teachings Endless people have studied just what I said to you mm. and found it to be. A... So anyway, that's what I try to do in my own way. I mean, I'm not a Rinpoche or anything like that. I'm just a practitioner. Try to help people get ready to be able to relax. Because when we die, when we go into the bardos, it's going to be very much dependent on our ability to relax as to what we experience there that idea anyway that's a wow. quick answer wow such, such a profound wisdom that's absolutely remarkable and i love that word to relax as well because I, I i struggle with relaxing in in the present moment so that's that's really quite interesting but it is interesting i mean i, I feel the same way i mean mm. it's so i study that right and I, I i tried to i'm not a very good intellectual i don't like too many words or or too much intellect because mm. I think those are just pointers language. So I think I mentioned language. That's just language that points to an experience that we need to have. How do you generate experience? I think that's what I do with my Facebook blog is help people to generate their own experience after which they can grow it. Wow. But if you, if you, if you don't get that spark, if you're not empowered, you can't do it. So how do you empower how do you empower someone? And that's what I, I wonder about. And I try to find ways of doing it. And I love that key word, empowerment, to empower others. So it's not lecturing others. It's not telling people what to do. It's, it's in, I, I don't forgive me if I'm taking words out of your mouth, but empowering others to make the, their own decisions. And as you said, to, to maybe relax in the moment, maybe not to dwell on the past or ponder too much about the future, maybe to be in the present moment. Is that the kind of the, the idea? Well, that kind of idea is is basically to become familiar 
with the nature of your own mind. Mm. We have apparently the whole definition of samsara is perpetual ignorance, ignoring of that nature. So how do we how do we stop ignoring the nature of the mind and learn to relax and let the mind and let ourselves experience the mind? How do we find that kind of experience? That's that's a, a problem that, that I'm trying to figure out and also trying uh, I mean, I figured it out for myself pretty good, but I'd like to be able to help other people have that same experience because I think we need we need the rest that comes from being able to rest so that we're not just like a piece of fat in a frying pan, right? <laughs> uh, and anyway, I probably longer answer than you want. You probably have other questions. Oh, I, I love this. This is absolutely fascinating. And again, it just... Uh, I just love having these conversations because it helps open up my mind and, and the, the viewers, I think, would love to to hear these conversations too. So to switching gears a little bit, can you tell us you are the first person to develop astrology software, uh, which was called Matrix? So would you care to share some of, a bit of history behind that and what made you decide to, to develop astrological software? Oh, uh, yeah. First of all, I'm the first person to create astrological software and share it with with my fellow astrologers. That's really what I am. Other people were tinkering around with computers beside me, but I'm the only one that said, okay, I did this. Here's a program that will do astrology charts for you. Hmm. Uh, and then and for a long time, I gave it away. Uh, and back then it was all on cassette tapes. There were no hard drives. There were no printers. Uh, so anyway, but where that came from was simply, you know, that old National Enquirer magazine, inquiring minds want to know. I had an inquiring mind and I wanted to know how certain things work. Hmm. And so I mean, four function calculators only appeared like in 1972 or 1973. There weren't any before that. It was all pencil and paper hmm. and trig tables and stuff like that. And so I just begin to leapfrog. I published a calendar called Circle Books Astrological Calendar with my brother, Stephen Earlywine, who was an astrologer even mm -hmm. before I was. Um, and that calendar went on for 40 years. We published one from started in 1969. And in the back of that calendar, I was in charge of a couple of pages, extra pages. And so I would... First, I would publish little programs you could do using a four-function calculator to speed up calculating charts, which were tedious. Mm. Even though people hated when computers, a lot of them hated it because they loved the you know, being able to rest their mind in calculating in a slow way. But you know that went away pretty fast. Um, and they got to just like it. So then I got into programmable calculators. And I can remember the first time I got uh, a really important calculator that I needed, I had to go to the bank and try to get a loan. Mm. And when I got there, I got with the you know the the guy that did that, and I was also really proud that I was an astrologer, and I thought that astrology was wonderful, which I still do. Mm. And he says, "Well, what 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 do you do? How do you make a living?" And I said, "I'm an astrologer." And he took a piece of paper from his thing and showed, "Hmm." That's right above migrant workers in terms of risk. And we're not going <laughs> to yeah. we're not going to give you a loan. Period. We're not going to. So so I had to go back three times, and finally they gave me the loan, and of course I paid it off. Mm. But but I gradually got into using these programmable calculators. And finally they had little printers on them and all that kind of mostly Hewlett Packard. And then uh, yeah, forgive me, I'm not technically minded, but I believe it's the the, the HP sixty. 67, oh, 67 and 95. 97. Yeah, or okay. 97, that's right. Yeah, well, the 97 was really a piece of work. But anyway, in 1977, I got one of the first home computers. It was called uh, Commodore PET 2001. Mm. And I waited and waited for months for that to come to my door and watch for the UPS truck. And I had programmed astrology within a few days so that it did all the planets very accurately. 
Wow. And did local space and heliocentric and all of that stuff. And then I began to share it with other people. So that's how I got into it, only because I needed it. I mean, in order to, it used to take me an entire day to do a local space chart with trig tables and pencil and paper. Suddenly I could do it in seconds. Um, so I don't know if that's what you're after. Well, oh, sure, that's, that's revolutionary. I mean, today, my generation, we don't know we're born because, like I said, we can pull up our phone, get on the internet just to have right. things instantly calculated. That's so at exactly. Kepler College, as we go through and I graduated, we're made to calculate, calculate charts by hand, which I thought was uh, still a great idea for astrologers to be able to calculate charts by hand. So we were made to do that. And I felt more intimate with the charts I was putting mm -hmm. together as I was calculating it by hand. So do you think we're kind of losing that element? Do you think it's gone now? It's the the, the, yeah, the horse is bolted. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's I think we're losing it. I don't think it matters to do it the old way. I think it would be helpful hmm. to understand what you're doing. And I think some of the problems with computers is that I can give you a for instance. If you if you if you're looking at aspects that are forming and you you have some kind of a uh you know how close does that aspect have to be for you to, to call it you know a trine mm. and if you program that into a computer and say well if it's not within this many degrees it's not the aspect that's a terrible mistake because i don't even use aspects in that way anymore. I always look at a 360 degree wheel. If that, if that's the only aspect and it's slightly out of orb, it's still the damn aspect. I mean, it's a hmm. close. It's more that aspect than it is anything else. It's certainly not. If it's close to being a trine and it's beyond whatever you decide, not that you know hmm. what it should be, it's not suddenly not an aspect. It's not unaspected. It's still aspected until it falls into the range of another whole aspect. That's a very it's interesting gonna... point. So do you think some of the, the downfall of putting in orbs, maybe, you know, for example, two to three degrees that we're, you're missing a, a, a wider right. picture if you start putting those specifics in there in terms of orbs? Yeah, I think you don't want to put that in there. Do you want to just make, look at, remember when we looked at your chart, on, mm. on screen it was on a 360 degree wheel so i don't have to guess about orbs i just look like and say well how close i think a, i think there was one planet that was um you know mercury was going to come around and create a t-square i don't need to to try to decide how can you possibly decide that it's this many degrees or that many degrees it's just stupid mm. uh you need to look at it and says what is, what is it more like than anything else hmm. or you know and so it's so it's not exact trying but what is it well it's an almost exact trying or it's a wide exact trying right it's not but to say that it doesn't exist or that it's unaspected is folly it's just you're missing the whole experience of, of understanding that all aspects all synodic cycles you're somewhere it's mm. somewhere. It, what? But so the question is, where is it? And so it's always going to be near one aspect or another, even if it's wide. It's still that's what it is. It's not anything else, or it's not suddenly unaspected or not not anything at all. So anyway, that's just an example of mm. what's not good about a computer. That's an interesting point. It brings me to another point here. What was the reaction, the initial reaction of the astrological community as you were developing the, these programs? Was it well received or were there no, some? It, it, it was the same. You know, the, the first thing I got was a famous astrologer, which I won't name, but I would love to name, but I don't think it's a good polite thing to mm. do. Sure. Um, sent me a letter. So he was a financial astrologer and he liked to make money. And he sent me a letter saying, I wish, I hope I have it somewhere. I think, but I, all my papers went to University of Illinois anyway, so I don't have it anyway. But it said that I had no right to sell my programs. This is when I started to sell programs. Eventually I had to because I had, I had kids and I was spending all my time making programs to send to other people free. Hmm. It says you have no right to sell a program 
for more than the cost of the cassette and the mailing. What? What kind of stuff was that? All that was financial greed uh -huh. that he couldn't figure out how he could make money from that. Mm. And that's all he did is figure out how he can make money. And I once gave a had a whole conference at, at Matrix. I had 21 famous astro uh, astrologers who were into uh, the stock market. Mm. And that all together, I could name them all down, which I won't. Uh, but they were all the ones that are the most famous. And these guys, and the deal was they would come and I would put them up and I would feed them, but they'd have to get there. Well, these almost all of them, or a good number of them, had to come to me on the QT and say, can I pay for their bus fare? Can I pay for the, this? They don't have any money. And so I had to ask myself, well, if you're a financial astrologer and you're telling people how to spend their money, how come you don't have any money? If I knew how to make money, I'd get myself a million dollars right off. So I, I that suppose was... that doesn't help with with some of the skepticism that's that's laid of astrology, because that kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm in no position to comment on this at all. But for, for being a financial astrologer, have you not got the means yourself to uh, to get to places, but yet you're advising other people in terms of right. their finances? That uh, I, I would agree in a certain way that that plays into that skepticism, because I think to myself, well, like, as you just said, make yourself some money first and then help other people. That To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense either. Exactly. And that's what I would ask myself is first thing I would do is make a million dollars and then I wouldn't have to worry about it. And then I could help you make a million dollars. But here you are trying to help someone to make a million dollars, but I don't think you are. Otherwise, you'd have some money because you would do it. If you don't do it for yourself, what the heck are you doing? So yeah, anyway, not, hmm. I'm just saying that's just an idea. I'm just saying that's one example where I learned that, gee, these guys don't really know how to make money. Astrology is not really about predicting the future, except if you can predict, you know, to the degree astronomy can predict all of these astronomical events, then it's predictive. And, and we're, like we said earlier, we're supposed to tell you what it means. Those, but we, you, you can predict this conjunction of Saturn and Neptune, but I'm supposed to tell you what it means. So, but, but I could also use it as a predictor if I mm. knew what it meant. So there's a in conjunct there. There's, there's something that's not right about that, and I think there's a lot of baloney in astrology. So, do, do you think it, on some level it could be a way of? You know, I, I see astrology as myself as as a weather report. So. You know, in terms of, of possibilities or, or probabilities, you know, if you've got the weather saying, you know, in the next couple of days, there's a 90% chance of rain, you better bring an umbrella. So in a way saying, okay, you've got this, this Saturn transit coming up, there might be an element of turbulence. Do you not think of it maybe in terms of a, of a weather report or not? Well, yeah, back, back in the 70s, I had a radio program called Star Time. And every morning I would come on and... Uh, I would give the astrological weather just like you talk about. Mm. And that it would just be a couple of minutes and I would pre-record it and send a tape for the whole week and they'd play it. And just a funny story is one night, one day I came on, I would also often listen in to hear myself talk, right? Just because here I am on a radio. <laughs> so I'm listening and suddenly they got another person. There was this deep velvety voice, this guy that just as smart as I was, he knew exactly what the right thing to say, but they somehow just dumped me. So I was just crestfallen. So I call in, it turns out they were just playing it at the wrong speed. Oh. <laughs> so, it was, but, so that's funny. Uh, that's my idea of what's humorous. That's, that, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, where are, what, yeah, whatever you want. I don't um, know where you... Yeah, wonderful. So. Um, I'd actually like to turn on to, because you've done so many things in your career. I mean, astrology is just being one part of that. So I don't know if this just is anecdotal, but having interviewed the, the likes of the, the brilliant Bruce Schofield, for me, I, I seem to meet a lot of astrologers who are either musically inclined or musically gifted. Uh, I don't know if that's been your experience as well, because uh, could you tell us more about your, your music background and, and, and the bands? I just find that's a fascinating um, coalition, I think, of, of astrology well, I mean, being into music in, in a certain way 
I don't know if that yeah. question makes sense. <laughs> no, that, no, it makes sense. I mean, I was very interested in music and uh, I was part of the folk revival of the late 50s and the early 60s. And, you know, I think as you mentioned, uh, I traveled with Bob Dylan, hitchhiked with him, got to know him, sat around with him. Uh, John Baez also uh, sat and had coffee with her, with her, but I didn't hitchhike with her or anything like that. She she always flew in. She wasn't a hitchhiking type at that point. She was already making money. I'm so, kind of curious of what conversations you would have with these people. Would it be, you know, it would be just life philosophies at, or, or what was going on that day or just everything? Was it? it no different than what you and I are doing right now. We're just oh. two people probing to find out what what's interesting in the other person and in themselves. You know, I, I had no idea the Bob Dylan I was with was the the Bob Dylan, right? I just thought yeah. this we're friends and he was a smart guy. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So I was, you know, like I could have got a thousand autographs. <laughs> easy, easy, easy for for a cigarette uh, or something like that back then. So um, it didn't, you know, it didn't dawn on me at all. So, of course, it, you two, two highly intelligent people just having the conversation. Yeah, that's what it was. So, yeah. And so I got into music in, in ni 1965. In the summer of 1965, it's the same summer that the Grateful Dead formed out in San Francisco. Hmm. Um, I started the Prime Movers uh, Blues Band. And uh, my first drummer was Iggy Pop. In fact, we named him Iggy. Because he came from a band called Iguana, Iguana, a frat band, and we were kind of looking down and we said, well, so we called him Iguana for a while, and then we shortened it to Iggy, and then he liked the name, and he went on to be one of the godfathers of punk. So ever uh, since, it's, it's been Iggy Pop. That's remarkable. That's right. So, so, so we were just, I guess I should say that what, what I was interested in, and we had a, we, we basically had a blues band. Uh, or we did have a blues band, uh, and I, I don't know how to say this. That I never had a grandfather on either side, so I I was hungry for older male anything in my life. Right, hmm. my my dad never talked about anything personal with any of his five sons. I mean, I I probably shouldn't say they maybe did with some of the other kids, but he didn't with me, and I don't think he did much with anyone. He just wasn't his nature. So I got extremely interested. Uh, I have to put on the Ann Arbor Blues Festivals in 1969 and 70, which were the first electric blues festivals that had scores of artists and their families together in one spot. And because I would, knew a lot about blues and been to Chicago, knew a lot of this, this music, they had me, I didn't help to form it, but I was in charge of feeding all these people all the performers drink, which was very popular, and food. Hmm. And they also arrived in Ann Arbor, some of them up to a week before for no apparent reason. So they're just stuck in the dorms or one of the university lodged them. And we would go and spend an entire night. Like I can remember spending a whole night with Big Mama Thornton drinking Jack Daniels <laughs> until the wee hours in the morning and stuff like that. So like, I got to know all this stuff. I would love to be a fly on the wall at that time. Well, well you'd have been a drunk fly, I'll tell you that. So <laughs> that's fine uh, as well. <laughs> so 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 what what happened basically is that I became I found in in the older black musicians, and we also played in the Ann Arbor had a one block black um businesses. Mm. We we played in a place called Clint's Club. Uh and all the older black people came to hear us because we played the old tunes all black tunes that they knew when right next door was a young black bar who was ashamed of us being there playing for their parents because they were listening to not to that kind of music mm -hmm. at all but anyway i became i began to interview all these guys and gals scores of them first with audio and then with audio and video because they eventually turned into what I called the Ann Arbor Blues and Jazz Festival, which I'm the official historian of. Uh, it started from 1972 all the way up to 
just a few years ago, it kind of stopped, but it stopped for years in between. Hmm. So anyway, the point is, is that I found in these older black people, kind of the grandfather, some of them didn't like white people, period, but a lot of them could care less what color you were. And they treated me just like someone that needed to, to know them hmm. and, and to benefit from their wisdom. And uh, so that's what I did. So I never really got famous or anything. I mean, Motown came and for a while, Motown, Motown came from Detroit and drove us around in, rem in limousines mm. because they wanted to have uh, a white band, mostly a white band, doing black music. Ah. And they would do things like they would arrange for me to have lunch but with my brother, with the Everly Brothers. We did, oh. which was amazing. Wow. But then when it came time to... They, when it came time to, to go to the studio, they wanted me and us to do exactly what they told us. Not the things that we thought were beautiful. Not mm. the old black tunes that were so incredibly gorgeous. Mm. They wanted us to do this stuff and I wouldn't do it. I didn't have... have that's, that's, somehow I'm... Oh, you've, you've frozen a little bit? I don't know. Yeah, hang on a second. It, okay. might, take a, it might take a second. No problem. There we go. I think we're back. Yeah, I don't know what happened exactly, but I'm going to have to touch this to see if I can find this. Oh. No, no, I'm not in focus. There I am. Okay. Anyway, so so we didn't get famous. as a, a basic idea because I wouldn't do the music. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and I've done that. All my businesses are based on my hobbies. I never hmm. like working for people. I like discovering. I like teaching myself stuff. Um, I, I think that shows remarkable character to not be persuaded or or taken by the ear to go into avenues that you don't want to do. So whether that's music or other things, that it seems like everything that you've done and pioneered, it's become it's come from within and then pushed out rather than again any outside influence. Uh, if if that's fair to say. No, that's a good. Yeah, you know, you're you're good at you're a good interviewer. Oh, thank so you. you know. uh, thank you. And I've seen a lot of them. So, um, but yeah, that's what that what you say is right. I mean, uh, that's true. And and I believe it was you and your brother who formed the band as well. And your brother was also an astrologer. Is that correct? No, no. I had another brother, Stephen, is was oh. the astrologer. We had five ah. boys. My brother Dan became a, a world famous guitar maker and repairman, and he still is. Dan Daniel Earlywine is really well known uh, in the music circles for being able to, you know, he made made guitars for people like Albert King and Jerry Garcia and stuff like that. And speaking, we our band played with Jerry Garcia for a while. Wow! And, and I was out at you know Fillmore Auditorium in what the summer of love, nineteen sixty seven. We opened for Cream. You know, I watched oh. Eric Clap Clapton shoot up speed in the in the green room before <laughs> the former stuff like that. So we we you know I was kind of like uh, Forrest Gump or whatever, whatever his name. What is that his name? But uh, Forrest Gump is uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. He's just out moving. It. He was somebody that was on the periphery of everything. So I was oh, always I on okay. on the edge of stuff, but not really in the center. Ah. Right? Right. So it was kind of there I was watching this and there I was with Eric Clapton and there I was with Jerry Garcia, but um, stuff like that. That, that. that was really quite incredible. So going back to before, you were obviously talking about astrology just being one part. And I've heard you talk about astrology just being one of the oracles where we can tap into the universe and hear it speak. So do you think that's that ties in for music as well? Because when you put on a, a great track or you listen, I was listening to your The Prime Movers band before on YouTube and there's something about music that you can connect you to a, to a different plane. I mean, I don't know if I'm describing that right, but do you think that's a part, the power of music as well is a part of that? I mean, you're saying it better than I could. That, yeah, that's what you say is true. That I don't know exactly how that works, but mm. a lot of astrologers like music. You know, Rudyard was a well-known musician. Uh, I love music, and I started the All Music Guide, the largest music database in the world, still it is today. That's right. All I Music, had, All Music dot com, is that correct? Yeah, I think yeah, that's right. I mean, I had, I was president of it and founder of it, and I had 150 full-time people, and and 500 freelance writers working for me. That's a wow. bunch of people. That's so, a lot of people. 
And we did the same thing with film. We created one of the two largest film databases in the world, allmovie.com. So, and then the largest poster, I'm an expert in rock and roll posters. And I did that all by myself and took pictures of 33,000 of the best rock and roll concert posters that ever existed, that kind of stuff. Wow. So anyway, wow. I've done a lot of very tedious stuff. And, and I think what's remarkable as well is is your generosity in, in terms of, you know, I've been to the the Spirit Grooves dot net website and the amount of free ebooks that you give away to the community i know physical books you've given away to to libraries uh, oh, is yeah. one of those the Cayley institute as well and some other places so, so your remarkable generosity to give all this knowledge away for free is 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 such a testament i think to, to your character and your generosity in terms of well, giving this knowledge to the community well thanks but you know basically the idea is that i'm not going to live forever so what am i supposed to do with it I don't want the stuff that I did just to dry up and blow away. I'd like, that's why I've placed it in different universities. You know, the Bentley Historical Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Illinois Library, and, and other places around the country. Uh, I just donated to the Rubin Museum of Art, of Oriental Art, 500 silks, no, pen and ink drawings that we had a, a fellow from... Uh, you know, a monk that came and lived with us mm. for several years uh, from Bhutan. And he was a brilliant artist. And his work I just donated to the museum. And he became the minister of culture later in his life in Bhutan. So the, I've, I've had all these people. I mean, I had a whole house next to me full of astrologers, right, of mm. people. We had a Sanskrit scholar. We had a, a you know an astronomer, we had the head of the Hare Krishna astrologers, we had jazz critics, we had like, we had eight bedrooms and we had them all full of people and it was kind of like a a wild time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. So that, yeah, I believe in giving stuff away uh, because I'm not going to live forever and also people need stuff. Mm. Uh, and certainly books, I've got, what, 326 books on posters or it, booklets that I wrote, all it, separate books, because I wanted to, because it, it, illustrator art, like I had somebody, I do a lot of AI stuff now with what's called Mid Journey. Mid Journey is a graphic uh, AI thing that you can do. I've created over 10,000 images, and some people, do, and I put them on Facebook, I use them. A very specialized interest, specializing in illustration, but people look at them. It's not art. It's not meant to be art. It's illustration, mm. and there's a difference. And though people who don't like AI art say, "Oh, that's not art." I'm not trying to do art. I'm trying to illustrate what I'm teaching, right? What I'm speaking about, stuff like that. But anyway, that, that's um, an interesting point. So it kind of comes to the point of AI. So do you think ultimately it's going to be a useful tool? for astrologers and, and the wider society to use rather, rather than this gloom and doom uh, oh, narrative always, that's surrounding it? What are, what are your thoughts in terms of but AI? There's always, there's always gloom and doom. That I think it's a paradigm shift hmm. similar to the internet. I had email in 1979, and I've worked for all the companies you could think of, Microsoft, Apple, all, all of them. And you know Netflix, for instance, I started Netflix with our movie data. They used our data for the first number of years until they made enough money to do their own. So I'm saying that these things come in, or when computers come in, a lot of people didn't like that for astrology. Mm. And then I can remember, I used to put on a thing at UAC and stuff called ACT. It was, a, instead of lectures, it was panel discussions, because I liked a group of panel discussions rather than lectures. From morning till night, we'd do that. And we had one on computer interpretations, and they had a monitor for the room who just sitting there bawling her eyes out because she felt that computerized astrology of interpretation is going to take her livelihood away. Of course it didn't. Mm. It just allowed them to make to, to sell five and ten dollar printed reports that otherwise no one was going to pay their hundred dollar fee or whatever it was. So anyway, what I'm saying is I've lived through a lot of stuff that always comes, it's always a doomsday doom, doomsayers. 
that that passes and then people get used to whatever's convenient whatever whatever's useful I, I think that's an excellent point so maybe utilizing technology and 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 maybe using it as a benefit rather than running scared from it, maybe. Well, but of... AI is going to be, it's going to rock the world. It's 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 a terrifying thing as well. Uh, but you know we have no choice. It's not going to go away. You can be sure of that because there's money in it. So do you think there's... astrologically speaking, any connection to, to Pluto ingressing into Aquarius soon for the next twenty years or so? Or well, any... I mean, certainly. It could read all of my books and then create a persona where you could talk to me and answer questions about my work and it'd be like I was there and I'll be long gone. So certainly that, that would be like that. that would be mind blowing. <laughs> well, it would be pretty easy to do. Yeah, yeah. That's uh and that's that's trivial. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, so so remarkable. So uh, I, I know we've been speaking for quite a while here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, last couple of questions I've got. What what advice would you give to younger generations, including my my own and younger astrologers who are who are coming out today? Through your experiences and your your life's wisdom, what what kind of advice would you impart to to younger astrologers? You're not going to like this, probably. Uh, but I would say is go go learn how to properly use your mind go learn how to meditate properly and it's not what passes for meditation that's not meditation that's just ridiculous that's that's uh, that's just learning to rest you do need to learn to rest but that's pretty advanced i would say that the biggest problem for astrologers now is that their mind is not right they think that just the mind just as it comes out of the box so to speak is good to go it's not good to go it needs to be trained and you need to learn how to use to recognize how to use the mind and use it and i think that if i if i, if I had a student uh which i don't uh that's what i would have them do is work on their mind because if their mind improved then everything they did would improve does that make any sense i mean uh, absolutely and i think that's that's fantastic advice for for all young astrologers coming up and another question i'd like to ask you in terms of what do you think in terms of certification in astrology so places like kepler college where and i know it's astrology is still not widely accepted but places like kepler college where you can go and get a diploma or you know, a certification what, what are your thoughts around these because uh, obviously there's a lot of people out there on the internet coming out and and just saying a whole bunch of stuff i mean what are your thoughts around this topic well it's a difficult question, but what I would say is that learning about anything depends on your interest, and it depends on being able to keep your interest up, so to speak. And if, if education, I was never much one for education because I mm. think that mostly it dulled the mind, it didn't pique the mind. I think that you want to find out what someone's, this is why I, I think that heliocentric archetypes are good because it can show where the talent is. And if you can take that talent and train it and 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 encourage it, that's what that's what has to happen. Uh, in in my opinion, that I don't I don't see that's happening much. I think that education it becomes too hierarchical. It becomes hmm. too much boss. And if it, if you can keep it a living, if it's a living learning, then I'm I'm for it. If it's not, it's just for me a, a whole home. Uh, it's not, it's, you need to somehow, here's another way to say, this is the Buddhist way to say it, that the teaching has to cause the student to develop their own experience. If it's not a spark that causes them to create a visceral gut wrenching thing that they can then proceed to work with, hmm. it's just going to be too abstract. It's going to be in one ear and out the other, or it's going to be using techniques. Like, for instance, astrological techniques, I believe, have to be empowered. Otherwise, you have somebody just blindly using technique that they don't know where it came from, nor do they really know what it's about. So I believe very much in trying to find a teacher that can empower you. Like, for instance, we could say local space for me or mm -hmm. something like that. I could empower someone with local space, maybe, but not anyone and not everyone. 
So it's like the student is looking for a teacher and the teacher's looking for students. So if that can happen in a college, if you have the good teachers and the good students, then I'm all for it. If it's just another intellectual exercise where you get you don't get unique and talented students, then that, you know it's, it's just not going to do any good. I think anyway. that's wonderful <laughs> advice, and I love the the key word. Then again, is, is empowerment to empower others. Exactly. Absolutely. So on to our last question for the day. What's coming up for you now in the present and the immediate future? What have you got any projects on the go or um, anything going on at this time? Well, what am I doing? Okay, I'm writing the main part of a book on a great post artist named Gary Grimshaw. Hmm. I've been invited to write about his work because I've collected his work, some almost a thousand pieces of it that I don't longer own. I just had to sell them. But I, so I'm doing that. But mostly I'm interested in, um, I think I mentioned earlier, how do, and what I just mentioned just a minute hmm. ago, I'm saying, how do we engender experience through using language? Mm. I mean, language is, a, as I said before, language depends on the sense that it makes, right? If it doesn't make sense, then it's, as I said, it's nonsense. And so I find that a lot of, a lot of language doesn't make enough sense. How, how do we get the consonants and the, the crushingness of the consonants or the, the howling of the vowels? How do we get the language to work so that I engender in you? Like, here, just take a look at this discussion today. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that some of what I've said will actually engender experience in you, that you will then take that little bit of experience, like a dough, a starter dough, and grow it into something much larger. So that's that's... I guess my best way of saying it. Wonderful, wonderful. And Michael, thank you so much for this conversation today. And you have imparted that on me. I mean, I I realize how little I do know. So going out and, and studying more of the heliocentric part. And uh, so I just want to thank you so much for this, for this interview, all the contributions you've made to the astrological field and through your generosities as well through this time. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today in this, this wonderful interview that will stay stay with me for a long time. Okay, and I appreciate, as I said, that you're a good interviewer. Thank you. I think there's good as, I like the, the Astrology Hub interviewer. Also, what's her name? Is it Amanda? Amanda, or? I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's also a good interviewer, but you are a good interviewer, and I've had, seen dozens of them. So... Uh, I think you've done a great job and uh, you're going to send me a copy of this. That's correct. Yep. I will send you, it'll take a, a couple of hours just to download, get on my computer, and then I can send you a downloadable link through the email yep. and then that can be downloaded from there. Great. All That's right. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been absolutely a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. All right. See you later then. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay.